had some issues with the scheduling. Uh, so we have an excellent event tonight. Yes, put your hands together for three excellent speakers. What we call Vladimir Ski from Spot. Uh, Ramira Perez who's visiting us from abroad. Woo! Yes, from uh, all the way from California. Um, and we have Pini Bakni from uh, Transfit Security. So we have a talk for each one of our Communities, DevOps, Cloud Native, and Open Source, and StatsCraft. So stay tuned for those. Um, we have a very special uh, session at the very end that we recommend that you stick around for, uh, which is a special CFP writing session because, ah, too fast. Hang on. Go back. Because <laughs> the DevOps Days Tel Aviv uh, CFP is currently open. Uh, this is the QR code, save it for later, take a picture so that you can submit your talks. CFP is open until the end of May, and we want you to optimize your talks for success, your CFPs for success, so we are giving you the tools to succeed with this very special session tonight. We really do want to um, encourage new voices on our stage uh, and good quality writing and, um, and acceptance to our events, so stick around for that, it's very good. Uh, and we hope that it'll give you the tools you need um, to write a great CFP. Our friends at uh, uh, AppSec IL are having an event May 16th to the 17th at Expo TLV. And our community has been given a very special discount code. So if you are interested in going to this event, uh, feel free to leverage this code. Uh, they'd love to see you there. It's a partner community of ours that focuses on. Come on in, Michael. Come on in. Welcome, Michael, from our team. <laughs> I'm going to die. I'm going to die again. I'm going to fall on my face. <laughs> um, so the OWASP Apps at KL is happening May 16th, 17th at Expo Tel Aviv, and you are welcome to leverage this discount code. We like to stay in touch with our community by any means that is comfortable to you, so please do. Uh, come on in, Mila. <laughs> People are going to die. People are going to die here with this. Uh, all right, come on, Amila is going to do the CFP session. Put your hands together, Amila! <laughs> um, so if you prefer Telegram, uh, use the, uh, the right. If you prefer um, WhatsApp, use the left. And join our community so that you can stay up to date on our upcoming meetups and things and the things that are happening in our community. A huge, massive shout out to the folks from Otterize who are hosting this event. On such short notice, they stepped up. And really look at this amazing spread in office. So thank you so much. I'm going to allow Lily to say a few words. Thank you. Hi, everyone. It's our first meetup, so be careful to take Abel. <laughs> Let's see how many of you got the joke in the name. We'll organize. We do authorization for back end workloads on Kubernetes. So if you say authorize authorization with a, with a Israeli accent, <laughs> yeah, the reception isn't great. <laughs> If you say authorization with your Israeli accent, authorization, authorize, authorize, authorize. Did you get a really cute animal called an author? We're <laughs> uh, building open source projects to make authorization for Kubernetes workloads trivial and declarative, like it should be on Kubernetes. So check us out on GitHub, stick the pens up there, and have fun. Hi. Thank you so much. Uh, Without further ado, hang on, let me bring here, sorry, it's here. Let me bring our next speaker into our stream. So as this is also a sound. Okay, let me remove this, let me add this. And without further ado, 
Can you do that? There we go, Community Tel Aviv Um, Is this the one that we prefer? How do we prefer to see the slides? This, like this? Okay. Um, okay, without further ado, Rebbe Tom, come on, join us. Mic is all yours. Probably not falling from this table is the main challenge of us today. <laughs> um, so, hi everyone. My name is Rubital. Uh, I'm the product manager of Ocean. I've been speaking for with a few of you, uh, and a few of you are using it. Very cool. Um, I've been working for Spot the, the last three and a half years, and my main focus was to talk with DevOps engineers and try to help them optimize their costs in the cloud. Specifically, in the last two years, my main focus is containers. Uh, and I guess today what we're trying, or my main focus in the, next, in the next 20 minutes, will be to give you four main things that you need to, like a checklist of four things that you need to have when you uh, think about your containers optimization, how do you want to do it, and what are the main things that you need to take into account. So let's get started. Um, so, CI/CD, probably most of you are familiar with that, heard of it, doing it. Uh, but lately, we are encountering more and more people that are talking about containers, uh, continuous optimization. What does it mean? It means that it's not enough to have an application, deploy it, and integrate it constantly. You also need to make sure that you optimize it all the time and make sure it costs you uh, the least as possible. So. I talked uh, in the beginning about four things that are the four things that you need to take into account. Here are the four things. In the next 20 minutes, we'll drill down into each and every one of them. So the first one is infrastructure optimi optimization. We'll talk about how do you do that specifically for containers. Following that, we'll talk about, great, I'm optimizing my infrastructure, but now I need to make sure that I'm also available because if not, it's not worth the effort. Um, the third thing that we'll talk about is application optimization. How do we do that? Uh, and lastly, we did all of the optimization in the world, and now we need to show it uh, and actually visualize it. So I guess most of you are familiar with it, but that's just a quick overview about what are the purchase model uh, that we have for nodes, for, in for instances. So the first one, and the most expensive one, is on demand. When you need it, you get it. When you don't want it, you just turn it off. Uh, so the advantage is that you have it when you need it, but the disadvantage is the cost. It costs a lot. The second option uh, that the cloud provider suggests is reserve capacity. Reserve capacity means we will give you a discount, but for this discount, you need to commit for a specific period of time. In some cases, it's one year or three years, depends. The last and the least expensive option uh, is spot instances. All the cloud providers today have it. Um, it means that you have the biggest uh, discount. Uh, they say up to 90% discount. But the disadvantage is in uh, up to two minutes, uh, they can take the instance uh, from you. So those are the three uh, purchase model. The idea is to have as much as you can uh, spot instances if your application can't stand interruption. You go with the reserve capacity. If that's not an option, you go with the on-demand. So we choose all of our infrastructure with the best purchase model. What's next? The next thing that we need to remember is that for containers, each container have different requests and resources. So we need to do a pod-driven auto-scale, which means if I have a small pod, I will launch a small node. If I have a larger node, I will scale a larger node, and so on. So that's a great uh, thing to say. But I want to show why it's important, or what does it give you to use pod-driven auto-scaling. So let's take an example of one specific pod that requests uh, 1.8 vCPU and 6,500 megabytes of memory. So let's say I have two instances. Give or take, uh, it's um, more or less the same price. The M5 is a little bit more expensive. So 
On the C5, I can run only one pod. But if I would choose the M5 extra large, I can run two pods uh, on this node. When I take a look at the memory utilization, it's exactly the same. But when I take a look at the CPU utilization, it's almost twice higher than the, um, in the M5 extra large. Now the question is, why do I care about utilization? You don't care about the utilization, you care about the cost. So um, if you take a look at the cost per specific pod, with the M5 extra large, you get a much lower cost per specific pod. So by choosing the right instance for your pod and doing a pod-driven auto-scaling, you get first better allocation. Um, so you get better allocation uh, and you reduce your cost by 43%. Even if you run on-demand instances and you only choose the right instance for your pod, you get a really big discount. I don't know where to stop. Okay, here. So, let's continue. Great, so I, I chose the, um, the right uh, purchase model, spot if I can, if I can't, I go to commitments. If I can't do that because I don't want to commit, I go for the on-demand. And I did that uh, pod-driven auto-scaling. Now, the idea is it's not enough to just launch the best instance type when you scale a node. The issue here with containers, because they're very dynamic, you always need to constantly optimize your infrastructure. How do you do that? So there are a lot of processes that uh, making sure that you always in the best utilization and you are uh, make, take the best out of your infrastructure. So let's take one or two, just for example, uh, scale down. Uh, scale down, bin packing, basically we take a look at your cluster and see if there is a better way uh, to bin pack your cluster. It means that we can arrange better the pods and run on less nodes that we are running at the moment. Um, another option is that there is no spot capacity available at the moment, but then we launch an on-demand to make sure you have the capacity for your, for your pods. But then we see that a spot is available again, so we can revert back back the on-demand to spot. So basically, I'll go to the final uh, summary of this section of, uh, of infrastructure optimization. Uh, in most cases, what we see from clients is that uh, they are over-provisioning. They use too much uh, infrastructure resources and they pay for resources that they are not using. So if we're summarizing the two things that we talk about, the first one is you need to choose uh, the best purchase model, spot uh, in most cases, array and on demand only if you don't have any other option. And the second thing is to have a pod driven auto scaling. I showed you the numbers, I show you the difference between choosing uh, one type to another. And just think about choosing the best instance type in a scale of hundreds or thousands of applications. And the most important thing is you, you need to do it constantly. It's not enough just think when you scale the first node to do that. You need to constantly check your environment and see if, if there is a better way to organize the nodes. If you'll do that, what would be the uh, outcome? Basically, the pods will uh, utilize all of the resources and all of the infrastructure that you are using. As you can see here, there is a blend between spot, on demand, the rise, different size of uh, instances, small, medium, large. Some of them will be probably a GPU if you're running GPU and so on. And this is the way you optimize your infrastructure. Great. We did all the things in the world. We, uh, our AWS bill went down, GCP bill, uh, doesn't matter where we are running. How do I keep availability? How can I ensure that my application constantly running and I don't need to wake up at night to make sure everything is working? The first thing that you need to do is to avoid peaks of interruption. What's a peak of interruption? A peak of interruption means that a big portion of my infrastructure went down at a specific moment. Okay, great. How do I do that? So first, you need to choose uh, stable markets to run on. So I'm not only specifically talking about our solution. There are also a uh, solution from AWS, for example, Spotfleet, that helps you choose stable markets. Uh, what's important to say about markets is that 
A market that it's currently stable doesn't mean that in one hour or in two hours or in one week, it will be still a stable market. The second thing that you need to make sure is that you're spreading across different ACEs and across different availability zones. Again, why should I do that? Uh, the reason is even the best uh, market in the world that runs for months uh, eventually will be interrupted. And when it happened, I want to make sure that not all of my environment is interrupted at the same time. And this is why I'm spreading across different availability zones and instance type to reduce the possibility that all of my nodes are getting interrupted at the same moment. A quick, I think uh, I've talked about, I've been talking uh, about it with clients a lot. And what we see a lot of times is that our clients complaining about interruptions we are spreading more and then they pay more so there is a balance between availability and cost that you need to remember like if you want to be the most available in the world you probably pay a little bit more uh, and if you want to just you know save the most in dev clusters and stuff like that so you'll probably be less available uh, so there is different uh, approaches to different clusters and this is something uh, that it's worth to remember now I don't like just to talk about things. I like to show in reality what's the outcome of what I just explained. So this is just an example of one of our, of our clients in a specific uh, VNG. It's a specific group of nodes. What you see in orange is the interruptions in vCPU. And in the blue color is the usage of this specific uh, group of nodes. What you see here is that the interruptions, there is no one high orange line, the interruptions are really uh, well spread across all of the uh, all of the time. You have, yes, you have minor um, interruptions here and there, but essentially not a big portion of your, of your infrastructure is going down at a specific time. And this is what you're trying to achieve with the spreading of your nodes uh, and choosing right and stable markets. Great. So we had uh, the infrastructure optimization. We understood how to do that. Uh, then we understood that we need to take into account the availability to check what our interruption rate, how we can uh, flat the line of the interruption, avoid the peaks of interruption. And now we go to the second layer, which is the application layer. So every container uh, have a request of CPU and memory. And in some cases we see that the actual utilization of the container of the container is lower than what is uh, requested. So even the best auto scaler in the world will do the best job. If the request of the pods or the containers is too high, it will not matter because it still will launch a bigger node than what the pod actually needs. So what you need to make sure that the requests are actually what the container needs. So one thing to mention about it. Um, most of the recommendation is to reduce because most of the people we see um, give the pods more requests than needed to make sure that they are not running out of memory or out of the CPU. But what needs to be cautioned with reducing the containers um, request is that if you reduce it too much, the container will not run. So just be careful with that. So again, uh, I want to show you an example of one of our clients which implemented all of the recommendations that we give him. Uh, it's really hard to estimate what's the cost reduction of uh, implementing this, um, uh, this improvement, but we see a very, a very uh, big drop in the, uh, in the cost of the cluster only by actually re uh, requesting the right amount of resources for the work. Great, so we are three steps uh, further into our journey into how to optimize container uh, infrastructure. The last thing that we all want to know is to visualize the cost. We want to see what we are paying for. Now I can have an environment and I know that I pay for it $100 a month, right? But I don't care about the all uh, cluster as a one unit. I care about each application separately because I can maybe optimize the application. Maybe I can give her a better uh, request. So the, from what we see, the compute cost, the compute cost for a container is the most expensive part uh, of the infrastructure. It's the, sorry, of the container's environment. This is the most expensive uh, part. 
Then we have the storage cost. The storage cost is actually, it's not the right order, but it's the least expensive part of the uh, environment. And lastly, we have the network cost. Uh, so in network cost, a lot of times for availability, we recommend, and the cloud uh, providers recommend to run multi-availability zone, but then clients are saying, okay, great, I'm running multi-AZ, I'm very available, and I paid, uh, I paid for it a lot of money. So here you can see uh, very easily what's the price of the communication inter AZ uh, and communication to the internet and so on. And by drilling down per deployment, you can actually make decisions. You say, okay, I see that this deployment have a lot of inter, inter AZ uh, communication. I might go and look into it. Um, so that's regarding that. So. Uh, now, the final step is just combine all of those four steps together. So, the first part is optimizing the infrastructure with which we saw that it's the biggest cost uh, for, uh, for companies today. How do we optimize infrastructure? We choose the right uh, purchase model and uh, we do pod-driven auto-scaling and we constantly do that. We constantly check the cluster and see, can I bin tech? Can I take the on-demand and replace it with spot? Can I take the spot and replace it with a smaller node maybe, or a cheaper node? Uh, and that's in terms of the infrastructure optimization. Next up is availability. Uh, this is the graph that I showed you with the orange line. What you're trying to do is avoid peaks of interruption uh, and try to choose stable markets and spread your nodes across availability zones and different instance types. Next step is uh, optimizing your application, request the right resources for your uh, application. And the last part is to visualize it, see which deployment cost me the most, can I, can I improve it, can I change maybe something in the architecture or the way it runs in order to reduce the cost. And as I said in the beginning, uh, optimization, it's not one thing that we do and we're over, it's uh, a thing that we constantly do and it's a uh, Things that we over and over and over again need to check, review, and make sure we're fully optimized. Um, that was the four things that I wanted to talk with you today. Uh, I'm here available if you have questions, uh, thoughts, anything at all. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Rabitao. Um, what I forgot to do, which was very important, and I want to do now, Right, right before I introduce Romero, is thank the team behind this community who are all, a lot of them are here tonight. So I want to call out your names and you're going to show yourselves. Uh, also, so that the community can know who you are and reach out to you. They're on Twitter, they're on other places, you can um, find them and connect. My computer will want to move, we'll do that, but Jeremy Hess, Bill Zellner, Nati Cohen, Laura Cohen, Julia Shub, Eric Zadi. Well, let's see if we can get our computer to show their beautiful faces. <laughs> Stop moving. Uh, never mind. There we go. Okay, Michael Aronson is also here. We have folks that aren't here, Le Vandelman, Andre Moore, Tal Kimchi, it's not scrolling, we love fish. Um, so any and all of these people, you can find them on the DevOps Days website, you can reach out to them, you can connect to them if they have Twitter, LinkedIn, um, and really um, join our community, you can speak at our events, any one of these people will be happy to hear from you. Um, if you're interested in, in talking at one of our meetups and uh, getting advice on CFPs or anything else, Boris Cherkasky, who is Mila's spouse, who is not here, but she's here for us because he's with the kids. <laughs> um, so without further ado, Ramiro, come on up. And big thanks to the team behind this community. It wouldn't be possible without them. Ramiro, I need you to join the stream yard. And then I'll also share a screen. I think so. Let's see how this works. 
Push your camera? No, right. No, no, from the camera and also you. And also you have sound. Rivero, it's Countess. Us all the way from California. So put your hands together. You only just landed from California. And you're going to have to do you. Tell me how dedicated he is. Let's see how the screen shared a lot. All right. Okay, now you should be able to share your screen. Let's see if this works. Okay. I'll just see if it's your screen. I lost you. Let's go back in. Share your studio. Share screen. Present. We got to the demo or never kind. Reminding folks on the stream that you can ask questions via WhatsApp. We're not really tracking the YouTube. So if you do have any questions for our speakers, drop them there. And we have folks from the team who are monitoring it. And I will too sometimes. <laughs> I have you twice in the screen, but I don't have your screen yet. Oh, there we go. There it is. There it is. Oh, okay. <laughs> Except I see the other one. I see like, oh no, I see it. That's it. Okay. Let's see. This, this works. Is this the one? Yes. yes. All right. Well, now you see it from me. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Sam uh, Ramiro. Thanks so much for having me here. Woo! Um, I was, uh, we're in town visiting some customers, and I, I reached out and, and it was kind enough to make room for us. So I'm excited to be here. I was in Cube kind of a couple of weeks ago, so I was very excited to see a lot of Israeli companies there. So it's really, really cool to be here. So today, we're be talking about 20 minutes. And, um, cloud native dev environments, and especially how you can use one of the newest um, Kubernetes features to start doing more advanced authentication, especially when you need to give access to resources outside of Kubernetes, which I, I call external resources, which is not the best thing, but there it is. So if you want to connect after uh, the meetup, that your code there will take you to uh, my long abandoned blog, but there are, are links there for Twitter, uh, Mastodon, and, and a few other things. I tweet a lot about open source startups, all that stuff. Um, Do you mind standing on this side just because the camera's... Yes, yes perfect. Also, it doesn't block the speaker. All right. Thank you. Thank you. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, let's start. I, I am the founder of an open source project, founder maintainer of an open source project, and a company called Otero, where we work on cloud native dev environment technology. So before I start, um, do we have a show of hands? So does anybody here knows when, when I'm talking about cloud native dev environments? What do I talk about? All right, one, two, there. Yes, that's more than we never get. Um, at a high level, the idea of cloud environments came to be, and there's like a lot of companies and open source projects doing this. Um, on the world of like, we're all building applications that are meant to run on Kubernetes. So why are we still using our local computers to build them rather than Kubernetes itself? Uh, this is a big movement. It's kind of part of the new experience movement, especially focused on, on the world of microservices and Kubernetes. There's a bunch of different open source projects and commercial companies. Um, Trying to solve this process, I'll tell one of them. We have an open source project. Check it out and please give us a start. There's Kitbot, give a code spaces, telepresence, tilt, scaffold, velocity, and a lot more. Like, so I was saying earlier, I was at QCon Amsterdam a couple of weeks ago, and it was really cool to see a lot of companies focus on focus on helping on helping developers um, build cube applications easier and dev environments, you know, predefined dev environments in code, the run of Kubernetes, code synchronization, remote debugging are some of the things that all of these companies are focused on making easier for everybody. Um, so I was saying earlier, like, 
when this whole thing got started, uh, we're already focused on just giving you, how do we get developers to Kubernetes, right? Minikube K3S was the beginning, then we have all these solutions to help developers move their dev environments into Kubernetes. Everything from heavy workloads to doing things like remote debugging, code synchronization, all of those things. But as this patterns starting to emerge, as more people got used to developing this way, we start to realize that, well, not everything runs in Kubernetes, which might sound obvious, but when you're spending you know, 24 hours per day on the world of Kubernetes, sometimes you forget there is something out there. Um, and this is what, and you think about it, right? As, as you build applications, you always need to have access to other things, like databases, queues, serverless functions, ML services, GPT, any of these things that Kubernetes and containers might not be the best fit for. Uh, and, well, once you have external resources, the challenge here is, how do you access them? Because Kubernetes has a very nice kind of native um, curve at a model where you have service accounts, you have identities, and then you can use this to authenticate to do things like network policies, access policies, even roles for other things you might have on your cloud provider. But what about when you want to reach out to things that are not on your cloud or that use a whole different um, authentication model. That used to be a very complicated thing. There's a lot of companies building solutions on this space. Um, and, you know, Kubernetes offers a few different ways to do this. So let's just go real quick over how do you give access to external resources in a way that is secure, cloud native, but also that gives developers a great experience. So, I mean, the easier one is, of course, you just put the credentials to what you need on the code, right? Just check in your API keys, Put them there, very easy to access. Yeah, no, no, never, never do that. I'm, I'm very excited that GitHub now has a really robust way of reminding you not to do this. I actually checked in an AWS key on my test account the other day. I was coding at two in the morning, and I got this million emails warning me, like, hey, they didn't do that, they didn't do that my account. So you should never, never do that. But, um, even aside, there are other ways that you can do this. And, and I've listed them in the way that I think they should be uh, considered from the less safe, maybe easier, all the way to what I think is what you should do. At a very high level, um, you can always inject credentials with a Kubernetes secret. Kubernetes secrets, for those of you new to the world of Cloud Native, are not really secret. They're called that because of a critical error that everybody can uh, agree it should be called something else. but. That's what they're called. They're not they're cute secrets, not, not secret secrets. Uh, but it's one way. Uh, a more secure way is you're mounting the credentials as a file. Uh, this has features to mount all these things as volumes to make it a bit easier to consume. Still not great, but you know it's getting better. Uh, then you, you can get into things like what um, Google Cloud Platform did with their CSI provider, where they give you a secret store and you can mount, you can project this to your pods as a secret. So now we're getting into a bit more robust, less error prone, still automated. And then one of my favorites is you can use something like EAM on Google Cloud, they're called workable identities. On EKS, AWS, they're called IRSA, RSA, which is identity roles with service accounts. And this allows you to map identities of your cloud provider to Kubernetes to do things like access to S3, buckets, serviceable cloud, things like that. It's really cool. They even work cross cloud if you set up things correctly. So I highly recommend you look into this. But what I'm here to talk about is a new feature that comes with Kubernetes 1.24, which is not so new, but fairly new, <laughs> which is uh, the idea of using projected service account tokens. What this does, it has a very long name, but a very high level, it allows you to give, create um, OpenID tokens um, for your service accounts that are owned by the pod, and you can use this to validate an entity across multiple services. This is this is how it looks like. Um, what you do is you decide out and you have your audience, which is you know, a string. You can define that yourself. You can use something for vision. And the way this works is at the pod level, you're going to define these tokens where you want them to be stored. The expiration of the token is key because you want to 
one short list tokens and the audience. Then if you look up, you can mount this as a mount volume mount. And what's gonna happen is that Kubernetes is gonna create this token for you using the, the cluster itself as the issuer. In the example I'm gonna show you in a second, you'll see how Google um, Google Kubernetes engine, GKE, actually has this in, built in by default now, where they will act as the open ID issuer for you, which means that you can run a service anywhere else and still use this cluster as a way to validate this tool. A good example of this is you have a pod that needs to access. Let's say you have a serverless function running on Knative in a different cluster owned by somebody else. By using something as a standard as, as OpenID or IBC, you can then exchange identities, verify that this pod is who it intends to be, and give it access in a more secure way. It's very useful. OpenID for this kind of thing is becoming very popular because you don't have to see like set up a trust between services. GitHub Actions does the same thing. GitLab also supports this on their CI uh, engine, and it's a better way, in my opinion, of doing security and access, especially when you need to reach out to things outside of your cluster. You can set up your cluster to even do this internally and to use OIDC for things like QCOMSAFE authentication. It's a bit more complex. I think there are commercial solutions that can do this uh, for you, but it is an option. So high level OIDC, uh, it's, a, it's a standard built on top of OAuth that allows you to identify tokens and give you the means to validate that when you have services that are not connected to each other. If you look at the token, this is what a Kubernetes OIDC or JWT token looks like. It has an audience, it has an expiration, it has an issue time, it has an issuer, and then you can add as many claims as you can. But if you look, one of the really useful things here is that Kubernetes will inject as part of the claims the namespace you're running at, the pod, the UID, the service account, and the UID. Which means that you can use this in your services to verify, hey, this is the pod running on the namespace that I'm expecting, and I will give it access. I'm not somebody who just managed to get access to your endpoint and spot their endpoints. Remember, the idea of this is to certify cluster to use to namespace to external service. There are other vectors that this won't solve, like you still need to do authorization, but this will at least allow you to understand who is calling your service and then start to think about your access to that. Uh, so this is to me one of the best things that come with, with Kubernetes, which is if you look at the, at the URL on, the, on your left, my right, uh, is that Kubernetes acts as a um, issuer. Uh, you go to that address, container.googleapis.com, in the case of GKE, slash, blah, 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 and then you put well-known slash open ID configuration, and you see something like this. This is public because this is a cluster informing anybody how this can be accessed. And this will tell you what the issue is, what kind of tokens it supports, the, the, the signature mechanism, and a few other things. Supported and the grants, the grants. So uh, this is the theory behind it. Let me show you a quick demo of how this works. In action is to show you some of the ease of use of this. And for me, what's important here is think of this from the perspective of you're building a platform. You want to give access to developers to move those services. Is how do you want to deal with this? Do you want to have to do a custom authentication for every developer, or would you rather? and go this standard way and give access to, to people in a more, in my opinion, secure, consistent, and easy to use, ideally well understood. All right, so for, for this demo, and I have this on my GitHub repo, I'll, I'll share that uh, with the slides at, at the end of the talk. Uh, it's, a, it's a very small application. Is, is this better? Uh, it works. <laughs> Can you pay my grading more than that? This is what it sounds to me. Just, I, mean, I like my grading, but it's not the best thing. <laughs> oh, this is. As long as they put on the streamer. <laughs> All right, well, I'm going to sit down for this part. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's see if we can do this with one hand. Um, now I got it. Okay. 
Are you sure? Okay. <laughs> that was the question. Let's get you on bus. Um, all right. So uh, this, this demo is just pretty simple. It's a bot. It defines the counter and it has a a cloud run function that actually does the verification of the token. So I'll, I'll show you the pieces. But this is the definition of the of the bot on the counter. It's a it's a default deployment. Uh, the thing that's here is I am setting up this projected service account token. I'm giving it a path, which is the name of the file that will contain the token. I'm giving it an expiration in seconds. In this case, to do 100 seconds. After that, Kubernetes will actually reissue the token for you. So from your application perspective, you have to be aware that you need to like, check that file when it gets changed. And then in this case, the obvious, which is part of what the verifying part of the the handshake will use to verify that it's signed and it's correct and all those things. So, in this case, I have this application running. And here, so for this, I'm using uh, our, our open source CLI, Octel. It has a command called deploy that allows you to automate deploying a bunch of things on Kubernetes. This case is going to run a command to deploy my serverless function. This is I'm using Cloud, cloud Run. On, on Cloud, and then it's going to run Helm upgrade to install this chart that I just showed you with an image that we just put there. So this will deploy the, the Cloud Run service on an account that I have set up with the cluster. <laughs> it's okay. Sorry, it's a karaoke machine. So. <laughs> that's, that's, that's it. 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 That synchronizes uh, your local code into the, the deployment that you launch at home, and it's going to give you a remote terminal into the into the pod. I'm using this because I want to show you kind of like the internals of the pod and how all those things work. Well, this runs. Let me show you real quick. Yeah, really, really but just like I showed you the definition, this is really what we have to look into. We have to look into the, the mount path of your token. In this case, it's going to be bar one sequence tokens. That is the volume, and this is the token that Kubernetes created for you. It's the file you call token, and in this case, my audience is still the community. Because we are here, and I'm sure that it actually works. So I, I made some I made some um, make file commands to so it's a lot of typing, but uh, there what happened. Ah, uh, show it. There we go. So this is the the token. You see, I'm, I'm doing a cat on this. This was created by by Kubernetes, the same token because that's the path I gave it. And if I take this. And use one of the many uh, public open source services to decode my token, you'll see that all the information is here. And, and this is what's, what's interesting about this. JWT, you can use this, decouple your body by verifying that the, whoever provided this token is actually running on the cluster. It's meant to be running at, you can see it here by the issuer. It's running on, in this case, a namespace tornado, which is mine. If I were to deploy this on separate namespace, we'll see a value. Um, the pod name, which is dynamic, also you see this, every token is scoped to that specific pod. The UID of the pod, which is immutable, every time it's a new pod, this thing will change. And the name of the service account. In this case, I'm using a default service account, but you could be using a custom service account that's tied up to another authentication system anywhere. So, when I go back here, um, now, it's, what I like about this is that you saw I'm using something open source, but actually what I did with this function is I set up an endpoint to actually verify the provenance of the token. So I'm using Insomnia. It's a great REST graph human client. You can use it. You really like it. So you see I have, in this case, not a Kubernetes endpoint, 
but the endpoint is called my cloud run function. So I'm going to send this. In this case, I'm using a better token. That's how I that's how I call it that function. And I click send. And same thing we saw before. You see that the clients were correctly parsed. Uh, I added this message that says this is authorized, which in this case is just checking that the uh, audience is still the but what, this, what I want to demo here is how you can use this inside of Kubernetes, outside of Kubernetes, to give access to use these tokens as part of your application. Uh, it's just another mechanism. I like it because it's short lived. You don't have to change secrets, and you're using trust and this kind of well known methodologies that are slowly coming into Kubernetes as a native part of the of now any cluster like this comes. And it will already follow with the energy. So 1.25 enabled by default, no, no feature gates, and it's one of these things. So just to just to finish, uh, this is a very powerful feature. It enables you to authenticate external resources. This is not just cloud provider. Again, this thought this was entirely designed to give you access to anything. You're the company, the technology of authentication. Process from the provider. Like you could have a satisfaction there, a custom function with the, the actual verification. It could be another Q cluster, it could be another service running on a different provider. It's, it's fairly standard. Uh, the token are short lived. You saw that I set it up to be only um, 22,000, no, 7,000 seconds, which is like 12 minutes. It's very important when you're taking the screen. You don't want tokens to be. That is a huge recovery vector, and it's something that you want to just not have to worry about. And so, say this is available as of Kubernetes 124. Uh, 127 is the latest, but all the other providers have, I believe, up to 126, which is a stable one for now. Um, uh, but yeah, but that's, that's it. Just a, a quick demo of, of how this feature can make, hopefully, your life and the life of your developers a lot easier. Uh, if you like what you saw, that's the CLI we're building. It's open source. Octello slash Octello. We're always looking for maintainers. We have about 40 people contributing to, uh, to an open source project. So if anybody else cares about that experience, Kubernetes, we'll love to have you there. Any questions? Okay, wait, before Toby, before we go, we have a question. Actually, I have two. First one is uh, who is actually generating the public private key? Is GPA? Is it Kubernetes? Or I can choose. It's Kubernetes. If you're if you're running your own clusters, you can bring that. You can bring your own keys. On GKE, by default, it's not that fine. But you can also bring. You have a service for keys. You can bring your own key. One I give yourself. So I shall I use my my my, uh, my certificates and I can even not go to Kubernetes to do Yeah, I'm not 100 sure if by using like the stock GKE you can do that, but if you're like using something like you've admin to roll your own clusters, all those things. Are there. And uh, the second question is uh, the service which is support this feature. For example, Judge GKE is not supporting. Uh, I see, so I cannot use it. No, but there is some mechanism that I can. To connect. So, if your service doesn't support this kind of like open ID, you would have to like probably build that too, either by building a wrapper service that calls into it. It depends on how you want to implement your own uh, authentication and authorization. This would give you the this spot is who this spot says it is, but that's all. Then you have to figure out okay, what well, that means that this spot has to do X, Y, D. Uh, an example would be like let's say you have an, uh, an open, ID, open ID token. Have your own service between OpenAI and Kubernetes that does this verification and then kind of relays a the request to your OpenAI endpoint. So actually, it's the Lambda just the Yeah, yeah actually, what I have here, which is Cloud Run, is the Google Cloud equivalent of a Lambda screen. This is the same thing. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. And then the epiphany suddenly right before we introduce our StatsCraft speaker. And we have two former StatsCraft keynotes here. We have Carmita, <laughs> and we have Matthew Boy. Say hi. 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 H
And we just found this library, we did the import, and the guys from r and just came to me and said, uh, listen, we need to send those traces somewhere. So Yager is the most recommended place. If you don't know what is Yager, Yager is also a only one solution for uh, both uh, producing traces, keeping them, and also visualizing them. In our case, we just use it for visualization. So once we had that ready, it was very simple. We just uh, the R&D team added this code, we rebuilt the dockers, we added this environment variable, and we shipped those to our uh, in-house uh, Yager installation. And that's it, we had traces. It was a very, very quick way, like it took less than a day of work, and we already had an amazing value. So everyone was very excited, but then we started to deep dive into what we really see, and we figured out that we are not getting all the information. So uh, what we, we noticed is that when you import OpenTelemetry into your code, you need to provide a requirement that OpenTelemetry will run before your code initiates. Otherwise, you don't import, you don't instrument all the libraries. So we realized that we have a good solution, but we need to go back in time for it. So uh, we took like a, a team of experts, and every one of us went and like and, uh, uh, researched a little bit to understand what's the best way. So my my personal favorite way to do something is I go to like companies that I appreciate uh, that do monitoring very well, and I check what they're doing. And it was unanimous. We need to use Kubernetes operator. So this is what we did. And when we started doing that, like when we got to this. Uh, uh, realization that we need to use Kubernetes operator, we were like, it can't be that easy. It's like, uh, it sounds like something is fishy here, but uh, it, it delivered, it delivered a bit. So from that point, uh, we started to rebuild our stack. So we went over with Kubernetes operator. But it's like a couple of words about Kubernetes operator and how it works. So basically, once you install it, just listen to uh, a specific annotation in your code, in your uh, pods or namespaces. And it checks to see if you have uh, a label that uh, enables it to inject a init container to each one of your deployments. And when you have that, uh, OpenTelemetry auto-instrumentation runs before your code, and it enables it to instrument all of the details, collect them, and send them uh, forward. So once we had that, the uh, result was amazing. So uh, we just added this, uh, this annotation to one of the next spaces we were uh, looking to monitor. We restarted all the pods, and that's it. We had it. So uh, everyone was super happy. We showed it to the developers. They're like, we're jaws dropped on the table because they were so excited. Because Basically, this also means that they don't need to change anything in their code. So we're coming like sideways and providing them with all these details. It was a huge success. But then, I don't know if anyone here works with Jaeger, and the UI is not the most beautiful thing in the world. So once we had the traces, we kind of wanted to visualize it in a nicer way. So one of our uh, parts in our monitoring stack is Coral Logics. We use them to ship logs. And we saw that they're going through a process of becoming a unified observability platform. And what we did is just we talked to them and asked how the traces uh, is working in, in their product. It showed us a really nice demo. It got us very excited. And we just said, okay, let's try it out. So once you have the operator already, the open telemetry operator they already configured, adding another uh, destination to send those details. It's really quick. So after we went down with it from the call with them, it took me three minutes to just add the, the chronologic traces endpoint to another destination. So this is how it looks like today. Uh, this is a screenshot from uh, our chronologic uh, system from the traces. So basically, you can see that you can see the whole flow. You have about four services that are uh, connected within this flow. So once, once you run open the library within microservices, it knows how to make those connections. And one of, one of the biggest things that uh, really surprised me and also uh, uh, I think it was very exciting 
is that uh, you have this related data section where you can see logs that are related to your traces. So uh, once you get to like to a point where you start investigating something, you can see logs in that same point and just uh, make those connections. So this was also very great for us. Everyone was very really excited about this, and uh, um, this is where we are right now. So I'm going to talk a little bit about expanding the capabilities of open telemetry. Uh, so one of the things we are excited to check right now is a log stripping. So um, this is correct for like a week ago. The log stripping is the least advanced part in uh, open telemetry right now. So they are doing metrics very well. They're already talking with Kubernetes APIs. You can replace it instantly. Traces is like where they uh, destroy like the whole industry. And with logs, it's still like defined as alpha, but we went ahead and tried it, and it's actually really good. Like we, we get much better uh, experience than uh, using Fluentd, which is what we use right now. Also, take a lot less resources, so this is big for us. So we saved about 200 uh, megabytes uh, of memory per node. So th this is a lot. Like when you we talk about high scales, uh, just for log shipping, uh, it was big for us. So some things we learned along the way that I would like to share with you. One of them is the sampling. So when we went ahead with this project, my uh, first goal, like one of the things that I, I told to the team is that we must apply sampling. So we don't want to get to production and send 100% uh, of traces all the time. It's going to explode both of our system and also we're going to need to pay to our projects a lot of money. So 25% is something I felt comfortable with and we went ahead with that. And what we realized along the way is that when you do sampling, it's uh, very naive. It's not really sampling like a full trace. Basically, it takes like random scans and removes from your details. So initially, I started like um, protecting my idea of sampling, but I realized that I was wrong. And it's not working as we, we were expecting it to work. Going back to open telemetry uh, documentation, you can see there's another configuration that is called tail sampling, which over there you can define like a full sampling that is based on traces. It needs a little bit more of uh, maneuvering and research to understand exactly what you want to do, but this is a good option to go with. Also, uh, for a logic shared with me that they can also do the sampling for us, but this is something that I don't want to do. One of the things that I'm excited about with open telemetry is the reason that I'm not supposed to be dependent on my uh, uh, Observability provider. Like I can change providers any day now. As long as they work with open telemetry protocol, I can do that. So, uh, as much as we love for logic, I don't want this vendor locking. So, I want to solve this issue on my own. So, this is something very important. I think sampling is something that is worth looking into. The second thing is load testing. So, uh, my, my suspicion was like this magic cannot happen without affecting. The performance, like you cannot ship all this information without hurting how your application is working. So what we did is basically we um, we ran a load test on our system without open telemetry, and then we uh, enabled it again and ran another load test, and the result was the same. Like we didn't see any effect on performance, but it's something that I highly recommend you to do because your system might act differently. And we can. Okay, thank you so much, Keenan. That was great. And I also need to say thank you for stepping up at the last uh, at the last minute. <laughs> we like to uh, throw stuff on people at the very last minute, so it's always very impressive when they uh, deliver. Uh, don't go anywhere. We are now doing our very special. CFP session. Um, do we need a bio break? Do we need a five minute bio break or are we good? Yes. Yes? yes. For the uh, <laughs> lady with DevOps days 2.0. Go, go, go. We'll wait for you. We actually have two. <laughs> so three minutes. Awesome. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Thank you so much. She'll be right back. She'll be right back. No, don't go anywhere near the other one. I'm not stealing out already.
like your emails or your Slack or your alerts or whatever, and then suddenly everything becomes much darker. <laughs> your day becomes much darker, and you have to go and bring some, you know, food for your child, and you have to, you know, you're already sorting your Slack and your emails and everything, all the messages that you get, and then you have to drive to the, the, your child to school or to kindergarten, and you're stuck in traffic, and then you go back home or to the office, and then you have a Zoom after Zoom after Zoom. And when is it, are, do you have any time to actually work? between all the meetings and the, between all the Zooms that you have to do, you're nodding now. And so you're like, after a while, you, you, you're feeling hungry, you realize it's 2 p.m., you haven't had lunch, especially if you're working from home, because nobody came to you and said, hey, do you want to have a good lunch or whatever? And then around 5 p.m. or 6 p.m., you have to go, you have to drive and take your child back home, right? And then you have like showers and everything that has to do with that. And then at 9 p.m., there's a, you know, there's a production incident. You're familiar with that? And then you have to work on it until like 2 a.m. And then, you know, and, and, the, and, and the production is not stable and the system is not stable, so you're going to have another incident, incident tomorrow. So this is how my life looks like, right? So I want to introduce you to Bob. Bob has eight tentacles. With one tentacle, is going to help you with the production incident. With the second, with, you know, uh, picking up your child from school. But what it, but it, but it really does is that it saves you two hours a day. Two hours with doing everything, you know, that you don't have to be the, smarter per the smartest person in the room in order to do that. And with, that, those, with those two hours, what you can do is you can spend it with the people that you love the most, actually being and not doing. Now, if you had enough time with your children, because it was Pesach, <laughs> and you're not smoked, <laughs> you no longer want to spend time with them, I feel you. You can actually do, you know, you can read a book, you can go to the beach. You can actually do something interesting for work because, you know, we said it that the, the system is not stable, so you're just doing uh, uh, incident responses all the time instead of actually doing interesting stuff at work. So you can do something like that. It costs only $500, and it's not sassy guys, okay? It's a one-time thing. Who wants to buy Bob? Raise your hands. Okay. So we have much more people wanting to buy Bob, which is wonderful. Hi, good evening, everybody. My name is Mila Finkelstein, and I'm a storyteller. That means that I help people to motivate others to action. And in our company, we do a lot of things. I guess we can do this, right? Because of the people at home. Uh, what is from Zoom? They, I mean, they're right here, so I guess uh, you speak loud enough. Do you hear me if I speak like this? This is an idea of a crap room. I'm sorry. Okay. One more thing I also want to ask is if you don't mind, you're not streaming your slides. Oh, sure. So, what do you mean? I sent you a link by email. Okay, let's see. Let's see if you got it. Oh, I don't think I'm connected to the internet, though. There's an open Wi-Fi of the honor as guests. Sorry about that. Pause for one minute. Sure. That's my bad. what I wanted to do. Oh, you can all see my shame, can't you? It's okay. What is happening? Oh, here we go. Otter, I guess it's open. It's my bad, sorry about that. And I sent, I sent it to your email. Email. Um, there's a link called StreamYard. Sorry about that, everyone can see. <laughs> sorry about that. I'm a bit busy this week. Um, okay. um, from me. There is. String your link. There it is. Just click on it. And then just go in and do the share screen and I will add it. Don't use the uh, mic or um, oh, I don't know what I did. Did just, I do you know, you're okay. just do mute and stop camera. So there's an echo, just put down your name. Great. Now it's to present. <laughs> Just 
Yes.
Okay, are you about done? It massively failed, he was not accepted. <laughs> <laughs> now why? I mean, it sounds interesting, doesn't it? You know, it's about psychology and production and stuff like that. <coughs> why did it fail? Because it was a, a description, but it wasn't the right description to the right target audience. Marketing experts, economists, you know, C-level, are those the people sitting in the audience? No. Why should we care about them? Right? So he didn't recognize the target audience. He kind of like, he found it interesting. So that he, he thought that if it's interesting for him, it's going to be interesting for the audience sitting there as well. And then the, the value proposition, it's not clear understanding. What is it? Why? Why does he need to understand it, the target audience? What can they do with this type of understanding? Right? So it really lacks everything that we need. Bob number two, as I mentioned, and nobody wanted to buy it, so maybe it wasn't strong enough for you guys. Bob number two is feature selling, it's advantages. It's saying, ah, I can do different things for you. So he tried to modify it, he gave it, he left the same opening, he cut all the C-level shit, right? I'm sorry for the language. <laughs> and then he left that. In this talk, through real life outage, we'll, uh, we'll uh, project those psychological principles onto the world of production, monitoring, and incident management. As a responder, you learn why those uh, behavioral patterns emerge during production incidents and what can be done to limit their effect. And as a manager, look what's happening now. We have a target audience. Right? You know that this can be relevant for you if you're a responder or if you're a manager. We also have value proposition of sorts. Right? You will learn how to create healthy environments, you will learn how to you know, do reproduction incidents and so on and so forth. It's still not strong enough because it's lacking bug number three. Bug number three is meaning. It's, it's a greater story. It's more than just fragmented features, right? It's something that gives us better value. And those, uh, that type of value needs to be both on a rational level and an emotional level. Rational is bottom line, okay? For Bob, I told you that it's going to save you two hours a day. That's a bottom line that I thought you might be able to reduce on your own if I give you a lot of things that you do during the day. That is a wrong assumption. People do not deduce it on their own. You need to say it out loud very clearly. And then we have the emotional meaning. What can you do with that time, okay? So it can free you to create better projects or to spend time with your kids. At this point, he already changed his title to something more interesting, though we're not talking about titles just yet. He kept the bottom part with the value proposition, but he added more information at the, at the top. Have you ever felt like you took every burn torn possible in the process of mitigating a production incident? Did you go through a three hours hell during incident response? Okay, that is a rational and very concrete value proposition. He's telling you that he's going to save you time. It can be three hours, can be much more, it can be a bit less, but we understand that there's a value here. Did it cause you to question your engineering or problem solving skills, right? Now we're going deep into the, you know, we're cutting throats, we're going deep into your emotional aspect, right? So not only that he's going to save you time, but he's also going to make you feel like you're a better engineer. Not just be a better engineer, but feel that you're a better engineer. So we have both a rational and an emotional aspect. He got in. Yay! Woo, <laughs> not just in. It was the very first time that he did public speaking, by the way, in a, in a tech talk. Give him the credit he deserves. It was a spotlight talk. It was a spotlight talk. Yes. <laughs> just like, like, a talk. like a keynote. Yes. <laughs> so what are we looking for? when we are creating that abstract. So we need to have an interesting beginning. It needs to be attention grabbing. We want to make sure that our target audience can see themselves in the description. So who will benefit from the talk? The challenge, 
a pain or a problem that they experience. The unique solution, if you have a unique solution. If not, it should at least be a solution. A technology, a method, a feature, a new perspective. The value proposition. Who will, uh, how will they benefit from the talk, both on a rational and emotional level? And then the learning method. How will they learn? Is it a case study? Is it a demo? Is it a live code? Right? What are exactly the tools that they're going to use in order to teach you the target audience, or you're going to use in order to teach them? You feel free to take a picture if you want to, and I'm moving on. I want to give you an example, okay? So the next example is a bonus is a, the last CFP, if I'm not mistaken, it's about schema evolution, okay? Schema changes should be a simple everyday event. They are not. Even with years of experience, production breaks more often than we'd like to admit when our schema evolves and in this talk we're going to explore why. So this is the challenge, right? The challenge that our target faces. This is the target audience, even with years of experience. It means that it's right for every type of engineer, right? Even management. This is the learning method through the analysis of several production and data incidents, and so on and so forth, you can read it. And then you're going to leave this talk with a concrete model on how to address schema changes methodically, hopefully making your next one not as painful as mine. So this is a value proposition with a unique solution, right? A concrete model, rational meaning, once again, a concrete model, right? and an emotional significance, not as painful as mine. That means that yours is not going to be as painful, right? We're going to save you pain. Title. So you have to have the topic in the title, right? And then try to have one of the, 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 of the three. The challenge, the value proposition, or the unique solution. If you can somehow do two of the three, that's amazing. That's like the holy grail. And try, if possible, to bring a hook to the table, something that's going to grab the attention. So let's see. So for Bowes, he really likes the challenges. Okay, so I had an APM addiction. Death with thousand schema changes, so dramatic. Uh, the, the mechanics of schema evolution. And here, stop the Cooper spending is kind of both a challenge and a solution in one, right? And a, and a value proposition. I myself, I really like value propositions in my, in my, in my titles. So write a proper CFP you can, from a line of code to an impactful story, uh, storytelling for tech talks, and from the keyboard to the stage, exploring talk ideas using the VRE method. The VRE method, what is that? Do you know? You don't, because I invented it. But, <laughs> 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 But the fact that you don't means that this is probably a unique value proposition, right? A unique solution. So that, that's kind of the holy grail. Even though this entire um, uh, title is a bit long, it holds both a value proposition and a unique solution that you can teach if you'd come to my that specific talk. Now, don't forget, <laughs> the CFP is just the beginning. And once you get in, you will have to actually build the talk. But you have such an amazing team, especially here in DevOps. They are so experienced, and they will do everything in their power to make your, uh, to make your uh, talk the best possible. It's been a pleasure, pleasure to be here with you, sharing a pizza, sharing an experience. This is my details. Good luck, and have a great evening.
I am Jesus. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mila. Put your hands together for Mila. She is so talented. Everything she says was brilliant. It was apparent. She's super smart. She knows what she's talking about. Why is this not connecting for me? I'm a signal. Oh, there we go. Okay, hang on. And to say, no, it's too much. I wanted to zoom in a little bit and I uh, went a little bit crazy here. Okay. Um, hang on, let me log out. On this profile. Sorry about that. Okay. I'm going to log in as myself. Okay, I just want to walk through the actual CFP page. The time. So you have an idea of what it looks like and what we're looking for. So first and foremost, we have a theme. We don't always have a theme, but this year we have a theme, and it's DevOps Horror Stories because the event is taking place on Halloween. Uh, so the more you optimize for this theme, the better. Uh, doesn't mean that all the talks need to be horror stories, of course, but we will cherry pick some of the fun ones, the good ones. If it's failure stories, if it's the outages, if it's whatever it is, uh, or any other kind of uh, crazy story that you might have. Uh, we'd love to hear them. Um, in terms of the format, so generally speaking, the large majority of the talks are going to be session talks, which is 25 minutes. There will be one single deep dive talk a day, which means, and you can only choose one. Uh, so, uh, actually, no, you can choose more than one, but just keep that in mind because you're better off optimizing for the things that they're more of, okay? So only if you really think that you have a super duper real compelling talk, I'm not saying that uh, you shouldn't believe that your talk is compelling, um, but really think about it and choose the right slot because there is um, a lot of competition for the ones that have very little, uh, few uh, slots on the agenda. We will be having double the amount of Ignites this year because people love Ignites, so we decided to have eight a day and not uh, five. So that is definitely something that you can optimize for. And uh, five minute bite-sized sessions are really great, really memorable. People really like them. I would I would pay more attention to this uh, talk type um, because they are actually pretty great. Uh, people like to be on the stage for a really long time, but you'd be surprised how much fun Ignites are. And they actually show a lot more professionalism because before you get it, if you can get a talk until five minutes, it actually shows a lot more skill than that. I was spreading it out over a long uh, session. Okay. Uh, another thing that's important to pay attention to is that there are tracks. This means that every single there are two days of DevOps days. Maybe I'll go over this. Two days of DevOps days, where each day uh, there will be a DevOps track, but on each single day there will be another track. Um, so on one day there will be a cloud native track, and on the other day there will be a cloud native and open source track, and on the other day there will be a stats graph track. Which means that if your talk is in the areas of cloud native and open source, or monitoring and observability, metrics, uh, other things that have to do with, uh, with uh, under the subset of monitoring and observability, please to do select the correct track because they are actually it's better for you to do that. The more competitive the tracks are, like the DevOps is a very competitive track, the less likely it will uh, be to be accepted. So optimize for the track that's right for your talk. You might be surprised that that will actually be better for you. I will do a quick overview of this, what the talks, what the tracks actually mean, so you understand what you're submitting for. So one thing that's really important, and Mila actually said this in, uh, in her explanation, and it's interesting, um, that that's true, um, even like as a general kind of 
um, rule of thumb for submitting uh, CFPs, but do not put the technology in the center, okay? Uh, the tooling changes. Tooling always evolves, and we're not really interested about hearing talks about Kafka. But if you have a higher order problem, or a universally felt challenge, or something, some kind of system engineering challenge that is demoable with a certain technology stack, that's okay. But the story shouldn't be idempotent Kafka with blah, blah, blah. That's the wrong title. It should be what is the pain, what is the challenge, what is the value proposition? Uh, so that's DevOps data. It's a very system engineering uh, um, centric uh, trend. Cloud native uh, day Tel Aviv, cloud native and open source focuses on cloud native and open source technologies as it sounds. Uh, the tool chains that enable uh, cloud scale. Uh, and Stats Hub is the subset of, um, of DevOps days, which is a, uh, largely focused on monitoring and observability and metrics and anything that measures your engineering. So those are the tracks. Um, and again, we like to have a diversity of, uh, of talks in terms of uh, proficiency. We want our community to be welcoming to new engineers um, who are just learning. Um, so we do want one-on-one -on -one talks, but there are also advanced engineers in our uh, community, and we want to make sure that there's something for everybody. Uh, so please do make sure to be um, to. to <coughs> to categorize your talk to its proficiency level so that we know uh, that we have a good amount of diverse talks. So Noob through Ninja, we're looking for all of them, intermediate talks. We want people to have um, a diversity of kinds of talks. And we will also ask you here to, um, to substantiate why you chose this proficiency level. What are the, what's the prerequisite knowledge that the person needs to have before they submit the talk? What are the concepts they need to know? Is this something that somebody doesn't know anything about this uh, set, this technology? Like, for example, Pini's talk, you don't know anything about open telemetry. Can you sit in this session and still enjoy it? That's 101. If not, if you need to have some level of proficiency, you have to know some of the tools that you're discussing, that would be 201. If it's truly advanced, like, you know, how you use open telemetry across clusters of blah, 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 you have no open telemetry very, very well, that would be a 301 talk, okay? So we do want you to uh, substantiate why you chose that proficiency level and categorize it the way that you have. Um, other than that, oftentimes, um, speakers drop at the last minute. And our keynote speaker dropped the week of our event last year. Uh, so there's always room for backup speakers. If you feel that you are born ready and that you are able to prepare a talk within a week of the event, you might be uh, called in as a backup speaker if you mark this box. So that is definitely an option if, uh, um, if you feel that you can and are able to deliver the talk at the last minute, you are more than welcome to, um, to take that box and we just might reach out to you. And uh, a good example of somebody who stepped up at the last minute was Leia Vogel. Last year she took that box and she was a backup speaker and she was on the agenda. Uh, so just, as you, just so you know. Um, so just as a... Uh, Summing it up, those are the things that we really want to know. Use the notes box if you feel like, first of all, we don't limit the character count. I always hate that in CFPs. We actually uh, feel like the more detail you give us, the more information we have uh, to understand what you're going to talk about in your, in your talk, the technologies you're going to cover, the things people are going to learn, the unique value proposition. We want to give you as much room as possible to describe your talk. Um, if you feel that there's still more information that you need to share with us, like the outline, the flow, um, if it can be demoed in different languages and you chose one for the CFP, but you can feasibly do it in a different language or whatever it is, feel free to use the notes. Those are at your disposal, and they help us understand what the, C what the talk is actually going to cover uh, and who it's going to be targeted at and how useful it is for our community. All of these are tools for you to leverage in order to help your CFP succeed. And we really, really do want you um, to submit a good CFP and for it to pass. Um, so this is what uh, the CFP includes. We try not to make it too difficult. Um, if you do have a video of you speaking, all the better. It's good to include those. If you do not have a video of you or a recording of you speaking from any kind of event, uh, it's a good practice to maybe um, record a one to two minute video saying 
why you would like to present this talk, why it's meaningful to you, why you're passionate about this topic. Um, anything for us to understand how comfortable you are in front of a stage, in front of people, in front of a camera. Um, that's about it just to, to cover um, the CFP itself. Um, are there any questions? Okay, best of luck. We really want to receive as many sessions as possible. Again, reminding you this is the CFP QR code. If it'll work. It's not moving today. But in any case, um, you can go to tldcommunity.dev slash DevOps days and you will have the CFP link there. Uh, thank you so much for coming and staying this late and listening. Uh, and joining us, you're welcome to join our WhatsApp and follow our community and our Twitter, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Yay! <laughs> Thank you so much, Adonis, for hosting. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming. <laughs>